Naraj Ray uh, founded Cultivate the City in 2015 to inspire healthy and sustainable living by empowering local communities with the tools, training, and resources for urban agriculture and vertical farming. Naraj holds a BS in evolution, ecology, and organismal biology from The Ohio State University and an MS in integrated environmental science from Bethune-Cookman University. He is a National Wildlife Federation Emerging Leader Fellow and formerly worked with the U.S. EPA Office of Water. Cultivate the City currently manages several farms in the DMV area, including a rooftop farm at the Washington National Stadium, a campus farm with Gallaudet University, and a greenhouse in Silver Spring, Maryland. In addition to managing a network of gardens, Cultivate the City holds weekly workshops and distributes their produce through a community-supported agriculture program. Cultivate the City also focuses on growing hard-to-find ethnically and culturally important foods. Thanks so much for joining us today, Naraj. Over to you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, with that, I'm just going to just jump right into the slideshow that I prepared for you guys. Um, feel free to ask questions in the chat as we're going along. Um, we'll try to take a few different spots in the middle of the presentation to answer some questions you guys might have. Um, and at the very end, I'll try to also save an extra 10 or 15 minutes for other questions. Um, a little bit of an overview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, first, I'll give a little bit of uh, background to Cultivate the City. Um, then we'll talk about hydroponic farming and vertical farming, what they are distinctly and what they are together as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit about crop selection, the things that we grow on our farm, as well as what I think would work well with different systems. Um, we'll talk about water quality and media selection, which is important for pretty much any system you use. And then we'll run through a bunch of different types of systems and with how, depending on how much time we have left at the end, I'll also walk you guys around at our farm location here and show you a few different systems in action. All right, uh, so a little bit about cult Cultivate Safety. We're a social entrepreneur. She gave a little bit of this background already for some of the different things that we do. Um, we help with a lot of school gardens. That's actually how I first got started with urban farming. Um, we teach a lot of classes. We uh, help manage a few different community gardens and urban farms. Um, we have a CSA program, a rooftop farm. I'll talk a little bit more about these later on. But last year, we had about four, we had four sites um, a little bit more than an acre of space in total, and we grew and distributed just under 100,000 pounds of produce. So I think that's a real testament to how much you can grow in a limited amount of space. And in past years, uh, we had more than 30 sites, which I think that might. So this is one of the slides that I had from one of my previous years that came up of some of our locations. And we had over 30 sites. And over the years, the number one thing that I learned is by employing more vertical and hydroponic techniques, I was able to grow a lot more per square foot in a given space. And it really allowed me to concentrate my energy in a limited amount of space to grow a very substantial amount of produce. Um, one of the things that got me involved with this was actually maybe coming on close to 10 years ago now. Um, I started on a project in India working with a strawberry farm. And if you see on that top, right picture. Um, those are pots that I designed as part of my grad project, and I'll talk about those systems at the very end. Um, but we transformed their growing system from uh, traditional methods growing in the ground using flood irrigation um, to growing in these vertical systems. And just over those two years, they were able to really maximize on their output. They put out roughly four times as much in the same square foot. Um, they've reduced their water use by more than 96%. And every single year since then, they've doubled the amount of production area that they've had under that production. Now they have more than 20 acres um, under this type of vertical growing system. Um, I've also worked with school gardens in Colombia, as well as the botanic gardens in Medellin um, to teach similar classes to help really get residents to use what, space, what materials they have at their disposal. Um, to create vertical farming systems to also use their urban and limited spaces. Um, this is a semi-hydroponic project that we have. Um, this is a rooftop farm that we have on the rooftop at Nats Park at the stadium. Um, a lot of what we use there are milk crates filled with, um, there's a fabric pot inside of them. 
with our own lightweight growing medium mix. Um, and then all the nutrients are fed to them through a micro drip system. And this being a rooftop garden, the number one concern is weight. Uh, we wanna make sure we're not putting too much pound per square foot. And we can't use a lot of the other hydro systems we use because water is extremely heavy. Um, roughly about eight pounds per gallon. And when you're using a lot of these big hydro systems, it's hard to have that much weight on the rooftop. So if you are gonna do a rooftop garden, make sure you get a proper weight load assessment done. Um, this was our previous location in DC. We used to have a rooftop garden. This was really a showcase of all the different vertical growing systems you can have. Um, we had about 1500 square feet under hoop houses or greenhouses. Um, one of them was an aquaponic greenhouse um, where we grew lots of leafy greens and herbs for our CSA. Um, and in the other greenhouses, we grew different crops in each one. Oh, sorry about that. Um, so now we're just going to jump right in. Uh, what is hydroponics? Hydroponics is defined by using a growing without the use of soil. Um, typically, you're using some kind of inert medium. It can even be peat moss and cocoa fiber. Um, you can have a bare root water system. Um, you can have rock wool. There's a lot of different growing mediums you can use. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But mainly, you're using something that doesn't have any nutrients in it, and you're feeding the nutrients to the plants through the uh, water. Um, the main three nutrients that you're feeding are NPK. There's a lot of micronutrients as well. Um, N is for nitrogen, P is for potassium, and K is for phosphorus. Um, and it, you see, I kind of laid it out there. It's in the same order, but the nitrogen is important for green leafy growth. Um, the potassium is really important for root growth, and then, or the phosphorus is important for root growth. Then the potassium is really important for different blossoms and fruit, your tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, things like that are going to need more potassium. Um, what are some of the advantages of using hydroponics? Number one thing is that it helps save on space, um, helps you get predictable results. It's kind of like an equation. You give a plant X, Y, Z. Um, if you control all the other parameters, such as temperature and things like that, you can have a reliable amount of crop. Um, another thing is you're heavily reducing your needs for different pesticides and fungicides. Um, you're eliminating the need for controlling your soil pathogens because there is no soil that you're using to begin with. Um, and ultimately, all of this adds up to helping you conserve water, energy, and fertilizer, resulting in higher yields. Um, conversely, what is vertical farming? Um, you guys can kind of read the definitions that are there. Um, it's mainly maximizing how much you're growing per square foot. A lot of people have a garden diagram, which is drawn in two dimensions. Um, and I like to reinforce that you should think of your garden in three dimensions. How do you really make use of the vertical growing space as to just the horizontal space? Um, traditional, or a lot of people when they think of vertical farming, they're thinking of skyscrapers, LED lights, um, multiple levels of growing. That is one method of vertical farming, but there's a lot of more traditional methods of vertical farming as well. Um, one example that I give people would be um, the three sisters crops. That's something that Native Americans used to traditionally plant together um, by growing corns, bean, and squash in the exact same area. You're able to get higher yields of all three, and that's because they're capitalizing on different areas where they're growing and their growth habits also supplement the growing of other plants. Um, a lot of tropical countries will do multi-level forest gardening where you have bananas, coffee, and then another crop growing together. Um, that again is a form of vertical farming in my opinion. Um, why do we grow vertically? I think very similar to the same reasons we grow hydroponically, um, we're very limited on space. More people are moving to urban areas where there's a very limited amount of space where you can grow stuff. And by growing vertically, you're really able to capitalize on your production per square foot, provide food local, uh, closer to where people are consuming it, um, which helps create more resilient communities, um, helping address climate change issues. I think growing vertically and hydroponically are both hand in hand becoming more and more popular. 
Um, some of the, or a lot of those other methods, um, they are, are a lot of those other advantages pertain to both hydroponic and vertically. Um, one thing that I would um, say that's different about growing in vertically, depending on what type of system you're using, is that it's really easy to install, relocate, move your plants around, um, which I think is very, very important for urban farming. With urban farming, it's a lot of changing spaces. Um, things can change on a dime. And by growing things in containers and growing them vertically, you're able to take them with you wherever you move. And that's a very strong tenant to our business because we have shifted locations quite a bit. Um, there's, a there's a million and a half uh, different systems that you can use out there for vertical farming and hydroponics. And I think that it's really key to understanding how these systems work and really tailoring a system to your needs. Everyone's gonna have different needs, space, um, a lot of different requirements that these are some of the factors that you want to consider when you're choosing what system you want to use. Firstly, space, not just X, Y, but again, Z as well. You want to make sure you have enough vertical space. Um, certain systems require power, certain don't. So if you don't have power access, you need to make sure you're accounting for that. Um, light availability, just because you can grow a lot of plants on top of each other, um, for example, in those vertical uh, stacking systems, I found through my own experimentation, after you do six or seven pots stacked up, um, you get very low production from your lower pots because it's uh, blocking out too much light from hitting those bottom plants. So you wanna make sure you're accounting for enough light for your plants to grow enough. Indoors, you may wanna, not may, um, indoors, I would strongly suggest supplementing with some kind of grow lights. Um, drainage is or isn't important, again, depending on what type of system you're choosing. If you choose a recirculating system, you don't want any drainage. Um, whereas for most system or most other methods of growing, you are gonna want drainage. Um, I did mention weight earlier for rooftops, but that's also a consideration for indoors. Um, just wanna make sure you're not putting too much weight on the floor and that it can actually support the weight that you're doing. Um, ventilation, again, if you're stacking too many plants in too little of a space, um, you'll create a heavy breeding ground for pests and pathogens. So you're gonna make sure you have good air circulation wherever you're growing. This leads into pest management. You wanna to try to have some protocols in mind for how you're gonna deal with pests. Again, not providing ventilation is gonna become a big breeding ground for a lot of different pests. Um, that, that a lot of management will help reduce the amount of pests you have. Um, growing medium, there's a lot of different choices. Same thing with crops. What do you actually want to grow? Um, I'll talk about the difference between recirculating and drip to waste systems and also some of the water quality factors that you're gonna to wanna to keep an eye out for. Crop selection. So I find in general for most hydroponic and vertical systems, you wanna keep with short compact plants. Um, my number one favorite plant to grow are strawberries. I love growing strawberries, not convincing anyone to grow strawberries and they grow like weeds in vertical systems. Um, I find you get much better production in the vertical systems. You can just see that picture on the top right. All the strawberries are just hanging off the side. You get even air circulation around them. Slugs dry out by the time they try to climb the pot. Squirrels can't balance on the pot and eat the strawberries at the same time. I just get far better production and far better strawberries when I'm growing them vertically than I ever do on the ground. Um, herbs, we grow a lot of different specialty, mint, basil, and tons of other different um, ethnic herbs, um, which just grow really well in hydroponic systems. One thing to keep in mind that's beneficial for hydroponic systems um, is that you're able to tailor your nutrient solution to the type of plant that you're growing. For leafy greens and herbs, typically you only need to feed your plant a nitrogen-rich solution and that's all the plant really needs to grow till when you harvest. For your, straw, or for your strawberries and a lot of other fruiting plants, you're gonna have to give a complete fertilizer um, as they start to get more leaves and or as they start to get flowers and fruit. So that way they can put on good production. So it does take a little bit more management. Um, we grow a lot of hot peppers. I find hot peppers are very compact. A little bit goes a long way. And we make a lot of hot sauces too, so that helps. Um, 
tomatoes, if you're going to grow tomatoes in hydroponic systems, I usually try to steer people towards growing cherry tomatoes and smaller, more compact varieties. The bigger heirloom tomatoes typically don't do as well, and it's hard to stake them up in a small system. Um, I'll kind of race through some of the other things that we grow, but later on in the question period, you guys can ask about any other things that you're curious about growing. Um, we grow ground cherries, lots of leafy greens, lettuce, Swiss chard, kale. Um, we grow some ornamental plants. We grow edible flowers. Again, edible flowers, similar to the strawberries. They hold up really well to vertical systems and makes it much easier to harvest them nice and clean. Um, onions, bunch of different herbs, uh, spinach, eggplants, collards. Um, the main things that I don't suggest you grow in hydroponic systems are big trees. Actually, grapes should not be on that list. I would not grow um, grapes in most traditional hydroponic systems. Um, you can do a Beto bucket or an individual system just for the grapes, um, but because they are perennial plants, it will be a little bit harder to keep that crop going through the winter in a hydroponic system. All right, so media choice. As I mentioned, there's a lot of different media choices out there. Um, the three most common ones that you'll find are clay pebbles, rock wool, and coconut coir. Um, some of the things that you're looking out for is the pH. If you see rock wool, it has a very high pH. Um, you have to make sure to treat that with either an acidic solution or lemon juice water to bring the pH down before you plant um, your seedlings in there. I'll talk a little bit later about why um, pH is important. Um, WHC is water holding content. That's how much water the medium actually holds between how often you have to irrigate the salute, the media. Um, porosity is how much oxygen gets in there. And CEC is um, cation exchange. And that has to do with how much salts that the solution or the media can actually retain. Um, there's a lot of things that you can go into with the medium. Uh, long story short, I would say coconut coir is my favorite of those three. Um, both clay pebbles and rock wool, they are not biodegradable. There's entire landfills in Europe that are filled with those two and they just do not break down over time. Coconut coir, I'll, I have a whole slide at the very end dedicated to coconut coir and why we use that pretty much ubiquitously in all of our grow operations. Um, but I swear by using coconut coir, it's a renewable growing medium that's made from the husk of coconut shells, very easily compostable. You can use it in your garden afterwards. You can use it to grow mushrooms. Um, you can use it to grow um, for vermicomposting. So it's a very versatile growing medium that has many lives even after you're done using it primarily. All right, pH, if any of you guys remember high school chemistry, pH is a little logarithmic, uh, logarithmic scale. Seven is neutral. Um, zero to one is highly acidic and 13, 14 is highly basic. Um, 90, I would say the high majority of plants, um, they like to be at around five to five and a half in their pH and what they like to grow. Um, one traditional rule of thumb is whatever growing or whatever pH they like in soil, you minus one from that number. And that's typically what the plant's going to prefer to grow in pH wise. Um, the pH is important because as I mentioned, it's a logarithmic scale and um, having too high or too low of a pH is going to make different nutrients not bioactively available to your plant. It's going to precipitate out and make a solid. Um, and so in that sense, it's not good and your plant can't actually absorb those nutrients that you're putting into the water for the plant. So it's really important to adjust your pH to the right, um, the right pH for the plant you're trying to grow. Um, for growing or uh, for measuring your pH and similar, actually, I'll just go to the next slide because some of the other things that you're going to measure are total dissolved solids, um, which is normally measured in parts per million, or electro electrical conductivity, which is EC. Both of those are measures of the same thing, which is essentially how concentrated your nutrient solution is. A younger plant is going to want a less concentrated solution. A more mature plant that has more roots can, can absorb more of those nutrients. 
can take a higher parts per million. Typically the cap of what I go for parts per million is around 1200 to 1400. Um, young plants normally start at around 300 parts per million. As the plant matures, I increase the concentration of what they're getting. Um, TD, uh, total dissolved solids and parts per million or and uh, the pH, you can get these different meters to measure those values. Um, in my opinion, it's rather expensive. It costs roughly about $100 per meter. And then you also have to calibrate your meter before taking those measurements. Um, so when it's all said and done, you're spending 140, 150 bucks to measure these two factors, which over time don't change that much. It depends on how much you're investing in your system and how much you're trying to grow. Um, but what I normally suggest is go to the pet store, get a bunch of pH strips. Um, you can also get ones that have the parts per million right on the other side of it. That seven to 10 bucks is gonna get you 1500 strips, which is gonna last you indefinitely. Um, and I think that's much cheaper and far more usable than investing in these meters, which can be very expensive. Um, some of the other things to keep in mind are temperature. This time of the year, if you're growing out, it, typically with temperature, your main issue is if it's too hot or too cold. Um, I do people uh, normally suggest that if you're uncomfortable, chances are the plants are uncomfortable. Typically below 50, 45 degrees is where it gets too cold for the plants. Uh, freezing, obviously the water is frozen and you're potentially harming your systems by all those moving parts and all the water freezing and expanding. Um, on the other side, if it, the water is too hot in the middle of summer, you might be boiling and cooking your roots um, as opposed to growing them. Um, but typically anywhere between 50 and 85 degrees um, for water temperature, your plants are perfectly fine. Um, tap water versus reverse osmosis water. I've never really had an issue with tap water. I always used tap water in my systems, um, but I know a lot of growers do swear by using reverse osmosis systems where your, art, where your total dissolved solids starts at zero. Um, but I've used tap water and in my experience, that's been perfectly fine. Um, I already mentioned about some of the testing equipment, um, pH, total dissolved solids. Um, if you guys have questions, we can come back to that later for testing equipment. Um, nutrient management, I did touch on this already as well, but the three main macronutrients are the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, the micronutrients you wanna make sure your plants are getting as well. Most commercial hydroponic systems you, or hydroponic nutrients you get are gonna have those micronutrients in there already. Um, but do make sure that it's added in there um, so that way your plant is getting the complete nutrients that it needs. Um, this is just going a little bit more into the specifics of nutrients, uh, but I'm gonna just keep going along because I wanna make sure we have enough time to go through all the systems. Um, I already talked about temperature, relative humidity, ventilation, um, some growers supplement their indoor growing with carbon dioxide. Um, that helps the plants absorb more and grow a lot quicker. Um, but most people aren't gonna start with that. That's when you have a really controlled um, greenhouse environment that you would try to do with um, CO2 supplementing. And that really only works when all of your other parameters are completely dialed in. The nutrients, water uptake, light, everything. Um, so that's kind of the next level. All right, so I'm gonna take a quick five minute break there to address any questions you guys might have before we jump into all the different systems. Thanks, Jaraja, we've had a lot of good questions coming in. Um, here's a few questions about managing a hydroponic system. Um, one question is, do you have to replant the plants after they grow too big in the system or um, how long can you typically leave them in there? So it depends on what you're growing. And I think this again goes down to crop selection. Um, one, one, the main example I use is lettuce versus basil. Um, we typically don't grow too much lettuce in our systems because with lettuce, once you, most head lettuces, again, loose leaf lettuce is a different story, but head lettuce, once you let it put on that head and chop that head off, it's not gonna grow again. So you do have to take out those roots and clean up and replant the entire system. 
basil is my cash crop. That is the one that I'll keep in the vertical systems and I can harvest off of it five, six, seven, eight times um, before it gets way too woody, way too tough. Um, but I get multiple harvests out of it before I have to change out the plant. Um, so that really comes down to what you're trying to grow and the crop cycle. Thank you. Um, another question is, is the time to harvest the same in these systems as it would be in traditional gardening? Um, it depends on how you're growing, um, but for the most part, you're speeding it up a lot. Um, I kind of used the analogy earlier with plants being icebergs. I don't actually don't remember if I mentioned that, but plants grow, spend a lot of energy to grow below ground. Traditionally, you have to spend a lot of energy to make roots, to get water, all the nutrients they need. Um, the other uh, analogy I use is an animal in captivity, where it, in hydroponics, you're spoon feeding all those nutrients right to the base of the plant. It doesn't have to spend any energy to grow below ground. It's able to expend all of its energy growing above ground. So they do grow a lot faster in a hydroponic system. Um, but at some point, like with strawberries and things like that, um, they reach their maturity and then they kind of cycle through what they're supposed to grow, the stages they're supposed to grow at. Um, but for leafy greens and herbs and things like that, you're really boosting how quickly you can harvest. You can do a full harvest of lettuce every single month in a hydroponic system, sometimes every two to three weeks if you're starting your seedlings before you put them in the hydro system. Thank you. Uh, we also have a few questions about setting up a system. Um, one person asked, how much space do you typically need? Um, maybe if you're a beginner looking to grow some vegetables and herbs at home in a system like this. So there's there's actually one system I, in the next, the next set of slides is gonna be all the different choices you guys have. And there's a million other choices as well. I can only touch on so many of them. Um, but one that I do not talk about in this presentation, that but I do use it, is called Aero Garden. It's a, a lot of the systems that I'll mention, their trademark names, companies, they have their product. Um, but Aero Garden is an indoor hydroponic system and it comes from something as small as like this that can just fit inside, not even on your kitchen countertop, like under a shelf or something. So they can start out really small. I have another system that's roughly the size of a mini fridge. Um, so they can get, they can range in size when you're growing, you can set up a whole eight, half acre, quarter acre with it or something as small as a portion of your kitchen countertop. Um, so I think it's really assessing what you need, how much you wanna jump in, start small. Start small and then gradually add on as you get more comfortable and you understand the mechanics behind how these systems work. Um, it's really easy to spend $5,000 on systems and have them sitting in your basement. Um, so make sure you're actually using them, you're implementing them, start small, and then as you're using them and getting function out of them, then invest your time, energy, and resources in newer or different systems. Great, thanks, Naraj. Is that a good segue to show us some of the systems? We have more questions too, so we can. Um, um, I think we to. should jump in, and I'll just do like ten minutes to try to go through these, and then we'll try walking around for a little bit. Perfect. Um, just one second. Um, all right. So the simplest of all the vertical systems you can do is an upcycled pallet garden. Um, you can get any pallet, flip it on its side, or first fill it with soil before you flip it on its side. Um, you cover the back with landscape fabric, fill it with soil, plant your plants in there, flip it on its side, and now you have your first vertical garden. Um, this is something fun to play around with, um, but not something that I suggest doing long-term because pallets are not meant to last long-term. Um, they typically only last for about two years and you wanna, by painting it, you can make it last longer, but not much longer. Um, if you are using a pallet, try to make sure it has an HT circle on it. That means it's been heat treated um, and not treated with arsenic, um, which is how most chemically uh, treated pallets are. It might over um, so water culture is the next basic system. Um, and that's basically having a tub with an air stone 
which is connected to an air pump in it, and that keeps the water oxygenated. Um, you can get an air pump and air stone from any aquarium store. It costs about 10 bucks. Um, it's the cheapest. You, I'm sure you guys have a Rubbermaid tote sitting around. Um, this is a really easy one to fashion out of what you just have sitting around at home. Um, you can have anywhere from, you can have one site in your deep water culture system, which is how we grow some of our peppers, or, or you can have as many holes as you can get into that tub on top, and you'll just be able to grow fewer plants. Um, but that is how the deep water culture system works. Um, next one is an ebb and flow table. Um, an ebb and flow table will typically keep the water underneath the table. Um, the water or the table that's above is periodically flooded at different intervals um, to help keep the plants saturated and growing. Um, this helps create both a wet cycle and a dry cycle. So more oxygen actually gets into the root zone and plants need oxygen just as much as water. Um, that's why in the deep water culture system, you have to have the air stone. Um, otherwise your water goes stagnant and the plants eventually suffocate from not being able to get any oxygen. Um, next system is a flood and drain. A flood and drain system is very similar. I'll just go back really quickly to the ebb and flow table. Um, with the ebb and flow table, your water is below the surface um, and periodically flooded above. With the flood and drain system, your water is adjacent to all of your growing buckets. And those are period, those reservoirs next to it are periodically flooded and then drained out to again give that dry period some more oxygen gets in there. Um, and next up we have a nutrient film technique. Uh, this is a system that I'm going to be able to show you guys in a couple minutes. Um, but the NFT system typically it's similar to the flood and drain but the pump is running consistently and you're basically there's water coming to the top of the system it's continuously flowing back down at a 45 degree angle back into the reservoir and then again going back up and that's why it's called a nutrient film technique there is no film it's just a continuous layer of nutrient rich water that's feeding the roots of your plant um, next up we have drip stakes and halo rings um, for drip stakes and halo rings, it's again very similar to the ebb and flow table, which is this one, but instead your water actually comes out through drip lines to the base of each plant in your top tray, as opposed to just flooding the whole area and then draining down. Um, so the next few slides that I'm going to go through are the systems that we actually employ um, quite a bit. Um, root pouches are what we use in place of any containers on our farm. Um, this is, allows us to also put them into aquaponic systems and different hydroponic systems while keeping the growing medium together. Um, this is a challenge when you're, that's why a lot of people use rock wool and um, hydroton, the clay pebbles that I mentioned earlier. And that's because when water is continuously running over these surfaces, the soil doesn't get washed away. If you use just coconut coir and put that in a hydro system, as the water is running through, all that coconut coir is going to end up in your water. Um, by using these fabric pots, um, you're able to keep that soil in there. The water comes in, the water goes out, um, and you're able to keep that growing medium and use the coconut coir in your hydroponic system. Um, root patches are made from recycled plastic bottles. Um, they come in a bunch of different colors. You can, different sizes as well. I think you can buy them all on Amazon as well. Um, they last for multiple years. I've been using some of the same ones for more than 10 years. Um, they're great uh, just for growing. They're very visually attractive, but most importantly, your plants grow a lot better. Um, the, the roots are automatically air, plume, air pruned, and that helps put on more healthy capillary roots, um, which will absorb a lot more of the water and nutrient rich solution that you're feeding the plants. Um, the pot also uh, 
the surface area of the pot is really useful for aquaponic systems because it provides a surface area for the beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizae to thrive on, um, helping your roots do a lot more work and grow or and absorb a lot more. Um, I can come back to root patches later if you have questions. Um, zip grows, these are uh, very small footprint systems. You can, these are really good to do on any wall, really. They only need about six inches of space. Um, they can hang off of hooks in the wall. You can design these little recirculating systems for them. Um, they're, if you've ever seen freight farms or those uh, shipping containers with growing systems inside of them, this is the main system that they use in them. Um, they're traditionally recirculating systems. Um, they are great for leafy greens and herbs. I find anything bigger than that does not grow too well in them. Um, you want a quick cycle crop and something that stays rather small and compact because it is a rather small footprint they have that there really isn't anything to stake them to. Um, these are really useful for live market sales. Um, so any farm that has these towers, um, you can actually take those towers with you to a farmer's market stand, um, sell the heads of lettuce or cut them off as they sell. Whatever doesn't sell at the end of the day comes back to the farm, goes right back where it started the day and they can continue growing until the next farm. Um, and it's very easy to combine the system with aquaponics as well. You just have fish in your water reservoir and they add the nitrogen and relatively easy to grow this way. Um, main thing is cost on these systems and they typically cost about 60 to $100 per column or tower in there. Um, the very top right picture is from uh, for the World Food Fair in Italy a few years back and they set up that stand with all leafy greens, um, very impressive display. And it's a very ornamental way of setting up your greens. Um, this is a little schematic diagram of how a basic aquaponic zip grow layout would be um, with your tank all the way to the right and water coming across the top, being collected on the bottom and coming back into that system to the right. And that's where your fish would be as well. All right, next up we have Tower Garden, and I kind of call this the five-star version of hydroponic systems. It's a relatively expensive system. They cost about $500 new um, for the base model, um, but this is what you'll see set up in a lot of commercial setups. I think that bottom right picture is from O'Hare uh, in Chicago at the airport. That's They have that set up there. And on the top is the rooftop garden at Union Market from a few years back when we were helping manage that garden. Um, they're recirculating hydroponic systems. Um, you can have up to 11 tiers high, which is 44 plants per tower. Um, the water at the base acts as the ballast. It's a freestanding system. Um, and the water is continuously circulating the top and coming back down. Um, part of the reason is I think a little bit more expensive than other ones is it's a lot more foolproof. Um, pretty much all the other hydroponic systems I've played around with or messed with, um, every so often you'll get a leak that springs up. And leaks are one of the toughest things to deal with because that is the whole point of using a hydroponic system is to save water. And if you're leaking out that expensive hydroponic nutrient solution, um, it costs a lot to replenish it every single time. And um, this system doesn't leak. Any leak goes right back into the reservoir right at the bottom. Um, so I've never had issues with that. Um, the, and for a typical home garden, it's very easy to plant in different things. Um, as I mentioned, for the zip grows, you can only do leafy greens and herbs in them. Um, whereas with these towers, you can grow pretty much anything. You can grow lots of different um, cucumbers, zucchini, things like that at the base. You can do leafy greens in the middle. Um, you can do herbs and peppers at the top. Um, so th there's a lot of different ways to interplant different crops in this system, as opposed to some of the other hydroponic system where you'll get a lot better bang for bucks sticking to just leafy greens and herbs. 
Um, and then veg towers. These are the systems that I mentioned earlier that I designed as a part of my grad project. Um, the pots are made from recycled styrofoam. They're a lot denser than regular styrofoam, which helps insulate them against both the heat and the cold. Um, this extends your growing season in both directions. Um, we are able to use coconut coir as the main growing medium. And this is an, a system that can be made uh, to run drip to waste, just which means that there is no recirculate. The plant, the pump isn't running continuously. And that's allowed me to help set up a lot of these systems off of solar power, um, where there is a pump that's put into an irrigate. Actually, yes, this is an example right here. Um, to the right, you have your reservoir that has the water in it. Um, you have a pump um, that's top feeding all of the towers. The water comes in at the top. There's drainage at the bottom of each pot, and the water just goes down from one level to the next. Um, using this method, you're able to run a pump for like three to four minutes a day um, during peak, um, like summer season right now, each tower is drinking about one gallon of water per day. Um, just using strawberries as the example, when you're growing in the ground, each plant needs one gallon per day. Um, and in each tower, you have about 20 plants. Um, so that same gallon goes a lot further irrigating 20 plants um, than it would in the ground. Um, and this is a very simple type of system to just set up in your backyard. Um, you don't even need a solar pa uh, panel. If you don't want to do it that way, you can just get a timer, plug that into the wall, and plug your pump into that. Hey, Naraj, I'm just checking in with the time check. We've got about mm -hmm. 15 minutes. All right. I think... Yeah, I'll just take a couple more minutes and actually we'll walk around after questions if we have time, because I think that's a potential wrinkle as well. Um, but yeah, uh, so coconut coir is the main growing medium we use. I actually talked a lot about, I already mentioned most of these points, so I will only go to that if there's questions later. Um, and a big part of what we do is education. I find with vertical farming, it, I never thought I was gonna be a farmer growing up. This is kind of very near and dear to my heart. I do love science. Um, I love experimenting and that was kind of my formal training in, through education. Um, but I never grew up thinking farming was glorious or the career that I wanted to embark on. And a big part of what we wanna do is inspire the next generation. And I think with vertical farming, hydroponics, it's just a different way of growing than our ancestors did. And it opens up a lot of new opportunities and just a whole new workforce for urban farming that we need to train the people if we're gonna create lots of urban farms to feed populations. We need to educate people and start creating that workforce to actually manage those farms. Um, and not to mention the therapeutic and environmental stewardship um, that these help inspire. Um, and me personally, I'm a business owner and I think that growing your own food, plants, the different products you can make out of them. It just, in, the possibilities are endless of how you can integrate farming into education, entrepreneurship, um, however the next generation wants to take this. Um, with that being said, I think I'll take a little break for questions. Thanks, Naraj. That was great. Uh, yeah, we have lots of great, great questions coming in. Um, let me share a few with you. Um, somebody was asking, are there methods to start from seed in a hydroponic system? Um, traditionally, uh, I would say no. You want to start your seedlings. There, there are hydroponic like seed starting kits and things like that. Um, but you want to start your hydro, your seedlings. Um, you can start them in soil the exact same way you start your other seedlings. When you're transferring them to your hydroponic system, you just rinse off all of that soil. Um, but you really want to maximize your growth in the hydro systems, and it's better to get them sprouted first um, and then transfer them. Thank you. Another person was asking about pollination. How does that happen? Depends on what plant you're growing. Um, strawberries are actually can be wind pollinated as well. Um, so indoors, people will run a lot of fans and things like that. Tomatoes and peppers are all self-pollinating. All you have to do is go by and tap the stem a couple times when the flowers are open. Um, the pollen will spread. 
Um, that's another advantage to doing leafy greens and herbs that you don't have to worry about pollination at all. Um, so it's really choosing the crop for what you're growing, where you're growing. Um, I'll do a lot of my things that do need pollination outdoors. So that way I don't have to go in there with the paintbrush all the time. Um, but indoors, if you're growing something that needs pollination, you're going to have to be the bee. Makes sense. Thank you. Um, a few questions about growing media. Um, someone was asking when you're talking about um, the clay pebbles, the rock wool, and the cocoa coir, um, are you able to use them season after season as long as there's enough of it, or do you have to replenish it, replace it? Um, how does that work? So, rock wool, no. Rock wool, you cannot use again because the roots grow through it and it's impossible to clean it and get rid of it. Um, your hydroton or clay pebbles, you can reuse. Um, just make sure you're disinfecting everything in between so that we're not taking pathogens from one crop to the next. Um, easy way that I suggest is a Rubbermaid tote. Just take, a, take everything, put in a Rubbermaid tote, and let it bake in the sun like today um, for a whole week. Everything will get cooked out. There won't be a living thing in there at all. Um, so yeah, that's normally how I suggest the resource, non-intensive way to do it. Uh, we have a few questions about Cultivate the City, um, and I'll kind of put them together. Um, one is, do you do tours of, of your facility? Um, where is it, and do you have tower systems there? Yes. So I have every single system that I mentioned in the talk today. I have one of those set up here. Um, we do tours pretty regularly. Um, you can always contact me. I think it's on the slideshow thing right now for our Instagram. Um, that's the easiest way. Just send us a message and we can coordinate something. Um, in addition, on the last Sunday of every single month, um, we do a plant swap here. Um, it's from 11 to 4. Uh, and people come out and they trade plants with each other. And starting at 10, 10 to 11, I do a farm tour. Um, so that's a great day to come out, trade plants with people, get connected with the community. Um, it really is a great group of people, and I can't recommend it enough coming out if you have that option. And the address, I think in one of the earlier slides I put the address, um, but we're at 15710 Lay Hill Road in Silver Spring. Thank you. Um, and as we get toward the close of our session here, I wanted to just ask you, do you have any um, final piece of advice or key takeaway that you hope participants um, um, will glean from your presentation today and also think about where they could go if they wanna keep learning? All right, uh, well, number one thing I would say is get started. Um, gardening, farming, everything, a lot of it's experience. As I mentioned, my formal training is not in horticulture or agriculture. It's really something that I've been very experienced based in learning. Um, get out there, you will make mistakes. That's part of the magic of it. Make those mistakes, learn from it. And every crop, it, the good thing about growing hydroponically is you have more crops per year. You can make 12 mistakes. Whereas outside, you can only make that mistake once, um, every year at least. Um, so I think that the more you experiment with things and the more you get your hands dirty, the more you'll learn. Um, the thirst for knowledge just kind of satiates itself. I think that there's a ton of online resources. Um, you can look up whatever problem you're having and there's someone talking about it for hours on YouTube. Um, it's just finding where do you get your reliable information from. Um, for people who are local and can come out, as I mentioned, you're always welcome to come to our facilities. We just got a coordinated time beforehand. Um, and we do teach classes regularly, both here and in DC. So if you're in DC and can't come out to Silver Spring, um, there's a brewery that we work with and we teach classes there once a month. And we just rotate our classes there um, every month a different class. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Naraj. And thank you so much for everything that you shared with us today. This has been really interesting. Um, thanks to our participants for all of your great questions and for spending a little bit of time with us to hear about hydroponics and vertical farming. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure.